friends in Christ. Dear beloved, treasured friends in Christ. In Christ. You see, Christ has chosen you and me to be his friend. And that means that by necessity, if we are friends with Jesus this day and forevermore, <coughs> then we must, it is our duty, to be friends with one another. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Not just 95, 98, 99.9%, .9%, but all every single one of our sins and our griefs our beloved friend our dear friend jesus our savior and lord our master he takes it to the cross and he brings us the gift of friendship and forgiveness and salvation dear friends in christ now i want you to think about our gospel reading today through the lens of friends or friendship. Because I think that we throw the word friend or friendship around rather loosely. I mean, you might have your BFF, your best friend forever. You might wear a friendship bracelet. You might have been a fan of that TV show called Friends. <coughs> There are friends with benefits, as though so somehow sexual favors are nothing more than throwing candy out at a parade or trick-or-treating at Halloween. What are the characteristics of a friend? Is it accurate to say, ah, uh, he's a rather poor friend, or fickle? or fair weather friend, a fake friend? That's a contradiction of terms, my friends. Because if a person is a friend, then they're not fickle, they're not fair weather, because Jesus is the source, he's the giver, and he is the substance and definition of what it means to be friend. Greater love, Jesus says, has no one than this, that a person lay down their life for a friend. So you see, we throw that word friend around kind of loosely, don't we? The other day I was visiting with a member of my congregation, and the doorbell rang, and her daughter Emma went, and her mother said, come and introduce your friend to Pastor Dave. So she did. She said, this is Zoe. I said, nice to meet you, Zoe. And then Emma said, this is my best friend. And I said, oh, can you have more than one best friend? Jesus does. He's got innumerable best friends. He calls you and me friend. When I was a pastor in Little Falls, Minnesota, 17 years, one of my teenage daughters she came up to me one day, and she said, Dad, you know everybody. <clears throat> I don't know if she was impressed or what. <laughs> but I said to her, I said, you know, that's an interesting comment. I said, I know a lot of people, but I said, you know, I said, they're acquaintances. I have very few friends. Why? Friends are hard work. Seriously. And if you haven't experienced hard work with a friend, then you don't know what a friend is. Friends are an inconvenience. They'll call you, they'll need stuff all the time. Can you imagine calling somebody up today, tomorrow, next week, next month? You say, let's get together, let's get together. Let, uh, I'd love to, but I'm too busy. Really? That's a friend? Or is that simply an acquaintance? <clears throat> Someone maybe you might even occasionally remember by name. What does it mean <coughs> to be a friend? When I did a Via Crystal, uh, a Crucio, a Via Enrichment, years ago, there's something I learned. 
at that weekend. If you want to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And that's costly. And that's time consuming. Now, will a friend lie to you? Will a friend lie for you? No. But instead they will come and they'll say, we need to go talk to your parents about this. Oh, no, they kill me. No, I'm going to be there right with you. We need to go and report this to the authorities. Yeah, but I can go to jail. But I'm going to be there with you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to be a friend with you. But a friend does not look the other way. A friend speaks the truth in love. Or they're not a friend. You just call out my name And you know wherever I am I'll come running To see you again Winter, spring, summer, or fall All you've got to do is call And I'll be there, yes I will You've got a friend I mean, let's be honest when we read the scriptures, when we stay close to Jesus, because that's what friends do, they keep company, they stay together, they don't drift apart and say, oh, I wonder what happened to our friendship. But a friend, when you need something, when you call up their name, they know what is required of friendship. Sacrifice and surrender and time. If you've got a good friend, then you know that that friendship can be an inconvenience. But, dear friends in Christ, that authentic, real, true friendship, that is a treasure that God gives to you today and for eternity. We have a missionary pastor. His name is James Udio. And he and his wife, Nandi, were born in South Sudan. Lots of persecution, suffering. They had to go to Kambala, uh, Ethiopia, where there's a refugee camp. And the last winter spring, Pastor Jay Udio, uh, mid late 40s, he and his wife went over there to Gambella, Ethiopia, to do mission work. And then he got terribly sick, lost about 100 pounds. Amyloid Cole says, I didn't know that before. Um, Proteins getting into your vital organs where they're not supposed to be, like in his esophagus and stuff too. His kidney shut down on dialysis. Hepatitis B. He's got TB. I mean, it's been a roller coaster ride. August 14th, he came into the mail system. Methodist Hospital, now at St. Mary's Hospital. And the last three, four weeks, his wife had been there, staying in a cot in his room, not knowing what the story of any individual day was going to be. The employer called her from Des Moines, Iowa and said, you come to work or you get fired. She said, you can fire me, I'll get another job. I don't get another husband. Well, James is improving. Off of dialysis right now, hopefully permanently. And so, Nandy had called the employer and they said, okay, we've given you three, four weeks off. We need to have you come back. She said, I'll come back. I'm going to Thursday. He said, no, you need to come back Tuesday night. Otherwise, we have to terminate. And so they sent me a text and they said, Pastor David, can you drive Nandy down on Tuesday so she can be to work? Can you drive her down there to the morning? And I thought, I can't do this. I mean, I probably could, let's be honest, right? It's all about priorities for all of us. I could have done it, but I chose not to do that because I had other commitments, right, in the congregation and stuff, people I needed to do a ministry with for. So my wife, she says, why don't you think about a bus ticket? So she did some research for me, found out I could take care of my congregational responsibilities, I could pick Nandy up at the hospital at noon, drive her over to Ortana, where instead of having to do transfer stuff on the bus, she could then take a direct bus 
down to Des Moines, get there at 6, and report for work at 11 p.m. <coughs> so I drive Mandy over there to Montana, and I get her at this Bur Burger King where the bus stop is, and uh, she looks at me and she says, Pastor David, you are such a good friend to me and Jimmy. Thank you, Pastor David. And I looked at Mandy and I said, I said, this is the friendship of Jesus. I mean, I could have said, it's my duty. That's what Jesus says in our gospel. It's my duty. It's my delight. I said, this is the friendship of Jesus. If the shoe was on the other foot, if I needed the help, wouldn't you and James help me? And she said, yes, of course we would. You know what a friend is. I know what a friend is. If a friend is a friend forever, it's because the Lord is the Lord of them. Yeah, you know that song? When a friend's a friend forever, if the Lord's the Lord of them, and a friend will not say never, and the welcome will not end. Though it's hard to let you go, in the Father's hands we know, a lifetime's not too long to live as friends. Ah, try eternity. That's what Jesus has given us. Years ago, we gave Bibles up to third graders. They were from the American Bible Society, Good Shepherd Edition. And when we got to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you know, where Paul talks about how we get saved, and he uses big words like estrangement, and reconciliation, and be reconciled. And, but you know what the Good News Bible has? We were enemies. But now Jesus has made us friends. Be friended with God. God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. So that in Jesus, we could become the righteousness of God. We could be made right with God. No longer enemies, but friends. In the Gospel of John, the farewell discourse, remember what Jesus does on the night of his betrayal? He has a last supper. And then he takes his robe off, and he takes a towel around his waist, and he washes the dirty, stinky, smelly feet of the disciples. And Peter says, uh, 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 not good to happen. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, then you have no share in me. Jesus has shared a last supper with his friends. And in the midst of that company is an enemy, a betrayer. So Jesus says, my word makes you clean, but not all of you are clean. And then after he gets up washing the feet, he says, you understand what I've done? You call me Lord, Master, Teacher? I am. If I then have washed your feet, I've given you an example of what friends do for friends. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples when you have love for one another. Well, later in that farewell discourse, chapter 15, Jesus is talking about fruit and vine and branches. And you may recall, he gives the new commandment. He says, this is my commandment, love one another. And then he says these words. No longer do I call you slaves. A slave doesn't know what the master is doing. I have called you friends. Because everything the Father has revealed to me, I have shared with you. You didn't choose me. I mean, friendship wasn't our idea, folks. It's God's idea. Reconciliation, forgiveness, atoning sacrifice. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that remains. Friendship. We throw it around loosely. Don't let the world define friendship for you. Let Jesus define it. Like in our gospel for today. Luke 17. Did you hear how Jesus defines friendship? 
God-given, spirit-infused friendship? Does a friend tempt a friend? No. A friend doesn't, isn't sneaky, doesn't trip them up. That's not a friend. You don't make fun of somebody, right? You might think it's funny, but it might not be funny to them. It could hurt them. Does a friend look the other way? No, a friend does not tempt a friend. If they see them going down a bad path, if they got a drinking problem, if they got a sexual addiction problem, I don't care what the problem is. If they're your friend and you see them going, what does Jesus say you do? You tempt them, you say, can I buy you a 12 pack? Can I give you uh, a subscription to internet porn? No. Jesus says you rebuke them. That's what a friend does. Right? And what else does he say a friend does? Well, what about forgiveness? Huh? We pray in the Lord's Prayer every week. Maybe every day. What about forgiveness? Somebody has wronged you, and they're a brother, a sister in the Lord. They're a friend. A friend's forever when the Lord's the Lord of them. And what do we do? Jesus says, it's your duty to forgive them. Well, yeah, but what about seven times the same day? Jesus says, if they sin against you seven times the same day and they repent, you must forgive them. I told you. Didn't I say that? A friend is an inconvenience. Friendship is just plain hard work. Greater love has no one than this, Jesus said. That a person lay down their life for friend. But when Jesus says this to the disciples, you heard what they said. They said, increase our faith. And Jesus said, ah, what is it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, this is a little speck. That's a, that's a mustard seed, right? You see how big of a bush it becomes and it provides shelter for the birds? That's all the faith you need. Because the faith you need to be saved is what the Holy Spirit gives you. It's the friendship of Jesus through his death and his resurrection. He's dying and he's rising for you for the forgiveness of your sins. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grace to bear. And then Jesus ends our gospel with that story. I hope you caught this story. It's beautiful. He's the master. He's the Lord. We're the servants. We're slaves to sin. He says, let's just pretend that you're the master. And you've got one slave. And they've been out working 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 12 hours, hot sun, taking care of the sheep, plowing the fields. And they come in, and they're sweaty, and they're dirty, and they're exhausted. And you say, what? You say, oh, why don't you take a load off your feet? Sit down. Let me fix you something to eat. No. That's not how it works in the world. Jesus said, you know exactly what happened. You say, get cleaned up right away, get that dirt off of you, put your apron on, fix me some food, my stomach's full, I'm hungry. And when the slave is done, does the slave expect to receive a 22% gratuity? Huh? No. Jesus is so also when we have done all that God created us to do, all that Jesus redeemed us to do, all we can say is, I'm unworthy. <clears throat> but by your grace, Jesus, you've made me worthy. And you've changed me from a slave to a son or a daughter. From a sinner to a redeemed child of God. When I was a pastor in Little Falls, I would go twice a month to the Lutheran home. And we would go into the chapel and I would distribute communion. We would have scripture, we'd have prayer, we'd sing a couple of songs, we'd have a short service. And one week, I said to Jean, my helper, I said, where's Mildred? Mildred Shelley had Alzheimer's. And um, she wasn't there. They said, oh, Mildred said she didn't want to come. She couldn't come. I said, I'll go check on her. I went down to her room. I enter Mildred's room, and I said what I always said. I said, Mildred, it's me, Pastor David. I said, you know, 
Your son, David, same thing. And I said, we've got the Lord's Supper today in the chapel. And she looked at me kind of distraught. I said, you know, Jesus' Supper today. And she said, I can't. I, I said, yeah. And she said, no, she said, I can't. I can't come. And with her head down, she said, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Eighty some years old, Alzheimer's. I got down on my knees, right by her wheelchair. I took her hands. I looked into her eyes, and you know what I said? I said, I'm not worthy either. I said, none of us are worthy. We're sinners, Mildred. But you know what the good news is? Jesus makes us worthy. Jesus forgives our sin. Jesus dies on the cross, and he's got his body and his blood for you today, Mildred. And she says, so I can come? Yes. There's nothing that would make your friend Jesus happier. Yes, you can come. And so together, she and I, sinners, unworthy, we receive the great thanksgiving of God. So how did I begin today? With the words that we need to hear every day and every week. Dear friends in Christ, dear beloved treasured friends in Christ, you just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. Winter, spring, summer, or fall. All you've got to do is call, and I'll be there. Yes, I will. You've got a friend. What a friend. What a friend you have in Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.